Throughout the 1790s, Tipu planned his revenge, trying to cement an alliance with the new French Republic and Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon wrote to Tipu in February 1799, full of the desire of delivering you from the iron yoke of England. The same month, under the new Governor General Richard Wellesley, Lord Mornington, the British made their move. This time the British were in no mood to compromise. An army of 21,000 men was dispatched under the command of General Harris. Tipu rapidly fell back on Seringapatam. Many of the officers who marched on Seringapatam had fought him before. Some had been his prisoners. On the 3rd of May, the British breached the walls. Tipu, surveying the breach at the end of the day's fighting, shook his head and said nothing. The next day came the final assault. Shortly after midday, the British forded the river, taking only 16 minutes, and crossed the outer ditch and ramparts. They then divided, Colonel Dunlop swinging to the left, Baird and Sherbrooke to the right. Tipu, fighting near the breach, regained some of his former courage and ferocity, but he was wounded fighting near the water gate and was killed by a soldier for his duels. Baird, who'd been defeated by him at Folilure and taken prisoner, was now led to the body of the Tiger of Mysore, a scene which inspired a popular engraving. A yet more fanciful version of Tipu's death manages to create a Turneresque landscape with a distant view of Haida's tomb. The fallen Sultan was given a sumptuous funeral by the British and was buried beside his father with full military honours. The officer charged with restoring law and order was the Governor General's younger brother, Colonel Arthur Wellesley, later the Duke of Wellington. The great man's contribution to the fall of Seringapatam had been modest. Never again would he move forces at night in unfamiliar terrain. Once again, the surviving sons were carried off as prisoners, and once again, the event was published in popular illustrations. The entire army received medals depicting the rout of the Indian tiger by the British lion. But the victorious generals were kept waiting for their just desserts. The elder Wellesley received an Irish peerage, and a full 15 years passed before the field commander, General Harris, received the barony of Seringapatam and Mysore East Indies and of Belmont, County Kent. His coat of arms, redolent with Tipu imagery, shows the flags of the company and the union, held by a grenadier of the 73rd foot and a Madras sepoy, above Tipu's banners and furled tricolours. Meanwhile in London, the East India Company had been receiving so many books, manuscripts, treasures and curiosities from India that a museum was opened. The most curious object that it acquired in the aftermath of Tipu's fall was the tiger, or rather the wooden organ in the form of tiger and man, discovered in the palace after Tipu's death. Lord Mornington dispatched it from India with the recommendation that the company present it to the king to be kept in the tower. In the event, it was the company's court of directors that acquired this crowd puller for the museum at their offices in Leadenhall Street. There, curious visitors could make the tiger roar and the victim shriek, disturbing the peace of many a reader in the library next door. It was the Tutankhamun of the day, thousands thronging to see it, the poet John Keats among them. That little buzzing noise, whate'er your palmistry may make of it, comes from a plaything of the emperor's choice, from a man-tiger, prettiest of his toys. Not exactly the Ode to Autumn. Tipu also inspired various dramatic productions, like this one at the Royal Coburg Theatre in 1823, with no less than Henry Kemble treading the boards as the defiant sultan. Tipu was um, very much a pantomime character, and in fact, as recently as 1905, Tipu appeared in a mummer's play in Sidmouth in Devon. So uh, his popularity has endured, I'm glad to say. There was even Tipu the board game, or the new game of Tipu Saib, as it was called. Staffordshire pottery figures were early on the scene, depicting the demise of the unfortunate Munro. This lustreware terrain was created as recently as 1976. Nowadays in India, Tipu is back in the spotlight. Not only has he become a comic book hero, but a massive television drama series has been broadcast based on the events of his life. In India today, uh, Tipu has been seen as one of the first freedom fighters. He predates the Indian mutiny by a good 50, 57 years by, at his death. Um, he has been seen as very much an Indian hero. Obviously, there is um, strong support for the Muslim community. Um, but on the anniversaries of Tipu's death, 
Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs and British, including myself, um, do come to Tipu's tomb to pay their respects and their homage, and he's becoming much more of a national figure than just a simply local hero. There's some controversy still as a result of the fact that Tipu was a Muslim ruler over a predominantly Hindu state. This makes him a problematic hero for some Hindu nationalist groups. So how universal can be the appeal of the Tiger of Mysore? Well, the curious thing about the tiger, of course, is that it has a very double-edged significance. Uh, there were lots of tigers in the forests of Mysore. Uh, the tiger was an old Persian uh, symbol uh, of uh, kingship and power, royal power and so on. It's also, of course, the, anim the, the, the vehicle on which the goddess Kali travels. Uh, and in a sense, that very neatly uh, says something about uh, uh, the way in which one shouldn't really begin to reduce uh, the history of Tipu into some kind of uh, battle between uh, Hindus and Muslims as if they existed as two corporate, uh, clearly defined uh, entities. It seems that Tipu is going to be around for a long time to come, probably as an Indian national hero. He'll certainly be a figure of huge interest to historians, not just as a warrior, but as an innovative and charismatic ruler. And perhaps most of all, he'll be remembered as an image maker who used the tiger as a symbolic device to signal his power and whose peculiar genius dreamed up the man-tiger organ.